Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the New York Historical Society. I'm Louise Mirror, President and CEO at the Society, and I'd like to give you a special thank you for coming out in such cold weather. Uh, it's a, a, a great sign of dedication to, to this topic and to our speakers tonight. Tonight's program, Lincoln's Constitution, is part of the Bernard and Irene Schwartz Distinguished Speaker Series, the heart of our public programs. And as always, I'd like to thank Mr. and Mrs. Schwartz for their support, which has enabled us to bring so many great historians and authors to the society. Uh, the program is also part of our series celebrating the 200th anniversary of Abraham Lincoln's birth and also part of our American Constitution series. I'd like to say that it, uh, it plays a third role as well, which is that it's a, um, a, a part of a new initiative at the Historical Society uh, around a, a graduate institute for constitutional history. And, uh, a lot of our thinking in developing that institute, which will begin offering its first seminars next uh, fall, um, derives from the, the huge groundswell of enthusiasm that we experienced as a result of offering programs like the one you're uh, about to participate in this evening. Um, the, the program will last, as, as usual, about an hour, and it will include a question and answer session. Following the program, please do join us for a reception and book signing with Akil Rita Marr, whose book you may purchase for a special program night discount in the museum store. Uh, I'd like to say that we'll also have available copies of several books that will be mentioned during the course of tonight's program, Lincoln's Constitution by Daniel A. Farber, Tried by War by James M. McPherson, Lincoln at Peoria by Louis E. Lerman, and The Radical and the Republican by James Oakes. During his presidency, as he fought to preserve the Union, Abraham Lincoln had to, had to grapple with many new and difficult challenges to the United States Constitution. As a result, he had a tremendous influence on modern constitutional law and American federalism. We're pleased to welcome two speakers who will discuss this topic. Benno Schmidt is the chairman of the Board of Trustees of the City University of New York and a very valued trustee at the New York Historical Society. He's the vice chairman of the Edison Schools, which he joined in 1992, serving in various capacities, including 10 years as chairman. From 1986 to 1992, he was president of Yale University, and prior to that, he served as Dean of the Columbia Law School. We're also extremely happy to welcome back to the Society, Akhil Rita Marr. Professor Amar is the Sterling Professor of Law and Political Science at Yale University, where he teaches constitutional law at both college and law school. He joined the Yale faculty in 1985 after serving as a clerk for Judge Stephen Breyer on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the First Circuit. He's published several books, including most recently, America's Constitution, a biography, and was a consultant to the television show, The West Wing. Legal Affairs Magazine named him one of their top 20 legal thinkers in America. Before we begin, as always, I'd like to ask that you please make sure that your cell phones are switched off. And now, please do join me in welcoming our speakers to the New York Historical Society. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. In a, a program devoted to the Constitution, uh, it seems uh, fair to mention a sad piece of news that Akhil and I just heard on our way here this evening. Um, our friend and, uh, in my case, former Columbia colleague Ruth Ginsburg uh, uh, has pancreatic cancer, is being treated for it, has had an operation. So uh, we all wish um, uh, Justice Ginsburg um, the very best under the circumstances, uh, a hugely important historical figure in American constitutional law in her own right. Uh, it's often said that 
James Madison is the father uh, of our Constitution, but that expresses uh, only a partial truth. Uh, yes, I think Madison uh, deserves that um, sobriquet uh, as far as the Constitution that came out of Philadelphia in 1787. But the father of the Constitution under which we live is Abraham Lincoln. The Civil War uh, was the most important uh, constitutional event since the Philadelphia Constitution. It solved not through any court decision, but through force of iron and carnage, the two greatest questions uh, in the history of our Constitution, the nature of our union, that is to say the fundamental question of the relation of the states and the nation, and it solved the most terrible challenge uh, that our Constitution has faced uh, historically, uh, the challenge of, of slavery. It's also given us examples of executive power in wartime that continue to this day uh, uh, to uh, occupy the highest uh, degree of, of relevance uh, in, our own, uh, in our own struggles uh, with the problems of national security uh, and the rule of law. We want to talk tonight uh, about the highlights of Lincoln's Constitution. It's a subject so rich we could spend days and days on it, and we have only a short time, so forgive us if we light quickly on a few of the high spots. Uh, perhaps a good place to begin <clears throat> is 1854, the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Uh, an act that various historians have judged uh, to be the worst piece of legislation in the entire history of Congress. Seems innocuous enough on its face, Akeel. Uh, the Kansas-Nebraska Act basically says that the legality of slavery in new territories uh, in the United States and new states will be decided by popular vote of the citizens of those territories and states. And yet, Lincoln finds this act profoundly shocking. Akil, could you give us your sense of why Kansas, Nebraska was so dis deeply uh, disturbing uh, to Lincoln? So ours is a compromised republic. It, um, uh, the Constitution uh, envisions uh, uh, protections of slavery, a fugitive slave clause. Um, it imagines that there will be um, importations of slaves that are uh, allowed until 1808. So um, why is this compromise with slavery, the, 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 the 1854 popular sovereignty, let's put it up to a vote in the territories compromise, so unacceptable? And, and Lincoln basically, I think, says, because it treats ultimately slavery as a matter of moral indifference. You know, putting it up to a vote, you know, well, some people like this, some people like that. And he basically said two profound things. Because um, he was a compromiser, but a moralistic compromiser. Here's the first thing that Lincoln comes to see. And he says it very clearly. Slavery is wrong. He says, if slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong. Second. We, don't, we can't get rid of it immediately. It's too much a part of our, the fabric of, of our life, of our economy. And the honesty and integrity of, of being square with people, saying those two things. You could think the one, uh, that slavery is wrong, and think we have to get rid of it immediately, and be an abolitionist, a radical. You could think the other, that, um, uh, well, we can't get rid of it. Stephen Douglas thinks that we can't get rid of it immediately. But to say both, it's wrong, and we can't get rid of it immediately. But Lincoln says, but since it's wrong, we must get rid of it ultimately. We must put it on a path of ultimate extinction. Maybe we won't even free slaves who are um, under slavery right now, but we have to come up with a long-term plan. Maybe it will take 100 years, he's actually going to say in, in 1858. But Kansas, Nebraska puts us in exactly